called joy. And today we're going to talk about restoring the joy. You know, a lot of families may have some measure of happiness, but what you want to have is ultimate joy. There's a big difference between joy and happiness. You see, joy, and you may want to take this down, joy is the confidence I feel because of knowing and trusting God. Joy is the confidence I feel because of knowing and trusting God, regardless of my circumstances. If you know and trust God, it doesn't matter what circumstances are taking place in your life. You can still have joy. But that's not true about happiness. Happiness depends on happenings. In fact, I thought this was interesting. I looked it up, and the, the word uh, from which we get happy comes from a word hap, which means, are you ready for this? Luck. So if you're lucky, you just might be happy. Well, I want something that's based more on something more solid than luck. Amen? Joy is based on the faithfulness of Jesus, and He never changes. You see, happenings can change. And if the happenings are not good happenings, then you won't, you won't be happy. But Jesus never changes. And so you can have joy all the time. Happiness is based on chance. Listen carefully. Joy is based on choice. That's important. Happiness is based on chance. Joy is based on choice. Now, today we're going to talk about three things that kill the joy in families, and then we're going to tell you how to restore that joy. And I want to make a special appeal to you as we approach this holiday season. Thanksgiving coming up, Christmas coming up. And for many of you, you always anticipate this thing with joy. And then for some of us, it doesn't work out exactly like that. Ever experienced that? You make all the preparations. You're, you're so excited to get to grandma's or mom's or whoever. And you're just so filled with this hope of being happy. And it doesn't work out that way. Well, today we hope to give you some little uh, hints clues to help you to have a happy holiday. But three things that kill the joy in family relationships. First of all, and this one should be obvious, but selfishness kills the joy in our family relationships. You see, selfishness says this. It says, I want what I want, and you want what you want, so we can't get along. The root problem, folks, of most family problems is this thing of selfishness, and it creates a, listen, power struggle. You ever seen that happening in families? If there is to be joy in any family relationship, there has to be agreement among the family members that, listen, that you won't seek to compete with each other, but you will seek to complement each other. To have joy in, the, in, in your family means that you take the emphasis off of yourself and you put it on the other person. When are we going to learn that? That's the very essence of the Christian life, is living to be like Christ. And what was Christ like? Christ -like. He was the ultimate selfless person. He lived for others. He came. Everything he did was for everybody else, his father and for you and I. So to have joy in your family, you have to get the emphasis off of yourself and onto the other per person. Learn to get up every day and say, Father, help me, show me how I can get out of myself and into the life of my other family members. Because whether you believe it or not, I know the world doesn't teach you this, but whether you believe it or not, serving others will bring you more joy than anything you ever do selfishly. Amen. You can applaud God for that. Amen. Now, James 3.16 says, For where envy and self-seeking exist, confusion and every evil thing are there. Ever been to a family outing where there was confusion and every evil thing? <laughs> Here's the reason why a whole bunch of selfishness was going on. Am I right? Think back on it. There's always a whole bunch of selfishness. You, you see, you can't be joyful and envious and jealous and selfish at the same time. So selfishness will always undermine 
any family relationship. And this means that, you, once again, you have to get the focus off of yourself. Learn to walk into a family outing. Learn to approach your family every day looking out for the interest and the needs of others. You know, many folks don't realize just how easy it is to become self-centered and selfish. I was talking, uh, talking, I, think, I wish I was talking with, uh, uh, with this pastor, but anyway, I was listening this morning on the way in to church uh, to a pastor, and he was talking about how that when he was a young boy, whenever they would eat, he said they had fried chicken every Sunday. Good idea. Good idea, all you ladies listening out there. They would have fried chicken every Sunday, and he said that, he said, I, have to, I hate to admit this to you as a pastor, but he said, I love the thighs, and he said, I always, he said, when I, when we had the blessing, he said, I always prayed with one eye open. <laughs> and he said, as I'm praying, or, or as mom or dad or whoever's praying, he said, I'm watching and I'm positioning myself in the right place where I can grab those thighs. He said, this was Dr. Tony Evans, by the way, you probably guessed it by now. But Dr. Evans says, the problem was everybody else was doing the same thing. He said, one time, mom caught me, and she took a big old spoon and splatted my hand and said, son, we all share around here, and because you did that, you don't get any thighs. <laughs> yeah. Get the, we, we don't realize how easy it is for us to become selfish. In the first church that I pastored, I'll never forget, we had a church picnic one time, and I'm leading the blessing, and all of a sudden I hear all this commotion. I'm hearing silverware rattling. I'm, I'm, I'm hearing tables creaking back. And I looked up, and two of our men were at the front of the line fighting over who was going to get the, to the line first. Unbelievable. But I hear that happens in our potluck sometimes. I don't believe that, but... <laughs> We don't realize how easy it is to become selfish. You have to get the emphasis off of yourself. By the way, here's, here's your first hint for Thanksgiving or Christmas. When you attend your family outing at Thanksgiving or Christmas, go with the attitude, listen, of offering, first of all, to help the host. How many of you hosts would say amen to that? There you go, see? Offer to help the host. It'll rock your world. It'll change your life. And then after you pick her or him up off the floor, ask them what it is <laughs> that you can do for them. Offer to, And then here's, here's another big one. When you sit down to have the conversation with your siblings or with that aunt or uncle or with grandma and grandpa, mom, dad, whoever it happens to be, when you sit down to have a conversation, listen, ask them about them, them, their kids, their interests, their life, their accomplishments. And by the way, don't be offended if they don't ask you about you. Listen to me. You'll, see, you'll hear this as we move further into this message, but there are a lot of hurting people in this world. And we don't always know who's hurting when. And they may need that ministering so bad that day that they are taking in what you're asking them and they are experiencing being able to share. Listen, for some people, they never get asked about themselves. No one seems to care. And if you show that you care, don't be surprised if they eat it up and they don't think to ask you. Don't murder them. Minister to them. Now, that's a... That's a New idea, isn't it? Shouldn't be. That's a good way to turn Thanksgiving into real Thanksgiving. Put the emphasis back on God and put the emphasis back on family. So selfishness kills the joy in our relationships. Number two, resentment kills the joy in our family relationships. Resentment says, I'm not going to forgive you no matter what. Think about that. You see, sometimes we do get hurt in family relationships. Would you, would you agree? We sure get hurt in family relationships. In fact, we usually get hurt worse in family relationships than anywhere else. Why? Because we love them more deeply. And the more deeply you love, the more 
deeply you get hurt. Now, sometimes people hurt us unintentionally. And then sometimes they hurt you intentionally. <laughs> but here's a fact of life. I may, may be shocking some of you, but uh, you're going to get hurt in a family relationships, relationship one time or another. You're going to get hurt. It's going to happen. And what you do with that hurt makes the difference between being joyful or being miserable. Now, which one do you want to be? You want to be joyful or miserable? What did I say? Remember what I told you? Happening is a, is a chance. Joy is a choice. You can choose to be, to be happy, to be joyful anyway. And nothing destroys a relationship. You see, what you do with that hurt will make the difference between being joyful or miserable, and nothing destroys a relationship faster than resentment. Hebrews 12, 15 says, Lest any root of bitterness or resentment springing up cause trouble, and by this many become defiled. Did you catch that? When somebody's resentful, it's like a disease. Many folks are defiled by their resentment. So if you've come to the place in your family relationship where you say, Well, you know, I'm, I don't, I'm not upset with you. I just don't have any feelings anymore. I don't hate them or anything. I just don't feel anything. I mean, it's not hate. I'm just empty. I feel nothing. You're kidding yourself. You see, it's usually resentment that's influencing your attitude. And that's the reason why you may not have any feelings. Because, listen, resentment eats up emotional energy. And you sure enough may not have any feelings. You know why? Because you simmer around that resentment so much, you think about it so often, it takes up all of your emotional energy, and of course you don't feel anything. You've used up all your emotional energy on that person, on that issue. You spend all your time resenting the fact that this person has hurt you, and pretty soon you have absolutely no emotional energy and you feel empty on the inside. You need to let go of their resentment because resentment kills joy in families. You say, well, oh, you want me just to forget what he did, preacher? No, no. What I want you to do is hand him over to the only one who can actually do anything about it. That's what you do. You say, I'm not going to keep hating this person. I'm not going to keep resenting this person. I am going to put spiritual handcuffs on him, march him over to my heavenly Father, and give him to him, and I'm going to go ahead and enjoy myself. That's how you get free. That's how you get free. Turn him over to God. That's not, that's not letting him go. That's not being a coward. That's being like Jesus. When the soldiers spat upon Jesus' face, when they beat them, beat his face with their fists, when they beat his back, when they treated him so, so badly, what did he do? He didn't resent them. He didn't hate them. The Bible says he turned them over to his father. You see, the same, listen to me, the same faith that you exercise to get saved, the same faith that you put in Jesus Christ to save your soul is the same faith you can put in that dear God to turn that person over and let that thing go. Think about it. Number three, fear kills the joy in our family relationships. Fear. Fear says, and this is the one I, I tend to run into most often in counseling, fear says, I don't trust you anymore. Maybe it's because you've been hurt. But when the, but whatever the reason, when fear builds up, listen, when fear builds up in your life, joy goes out of your relationships. When you are obsessed with fear, then every relationship that you get involved in will tend to dissolve. Proverbs 12, 25 says, anxiety in the heart of man causes depression. You see, folks, fear causes us to close ourselves off. It causes us to put ourselves in an isolation booth, if you will. 
and say something like this, I am never going to let another person know my real feelings because they might trample on them again. So we build walls and we isolate ourselves and we're miserable. And there's no emotional intimacy. And when there's no emotional intimacy, there's no joy. 1 John 4.18 says, look at this. Have you ever noticed this before? Fear involves what? Torment. As long as you're fearful, you're constantly being tormented from that fear. But he who fears has not been made perfect in love. When you understand how we sang about it this morning, oh, no, you never let go. Through the fire, through the storm. Oh, no, you never let go. I am not alone. You're always with me. I know who I am. We could go on and on. When you understand that you have been loved supremely by God, you, who, you and I who do not deserve his love have been loved by him. As Bill Gaither says so eloquently, I am loved so I can risk loving you. He who fears has not been made perfect in love. Fearful people can't give love or receive love because they're afraid to be hurt again. And I understand. I understand that fear. But this fear does three things to a family relationship. I want you to notice here. Here's the first one. It makes me defensive in a family relationship. It makes me afraid to admit when I'm wrong. Know anybody like that? They just cannot admit when they're wrong. They can't admit their faults because they're afraid it will make you better than I, If I'm doing it, I'll do it because I'm afraid it will make you better than me. You see, I don't feel good about me, and I certainly don't want you to feel good about you if I don't feel good about me. So fear makes me defensive. It makes me distant in a family relationship. You got anybody in your, in your family that's distant? It could be fear. Now you know how to minister to them. It could be fear. If I share my feelings with you, you might not like them. You might reject me. And so once again, the fear of rejection makes me distant. Number three, it makes me demanding in a family relationship. By the way, I want you to take, take a mental photograph of all these. I want you to think about this. You say, well, my goodness, I guess that explains why Uncle so-and-so is always so defensive. Well, this, ex this explains to me why, why aunt so-and-so is so distant. This explains to me why so-and-so is so demanding. Folks, it's nearly always fear. It comes across in so many times as being grandiose, but it's fear. You see, when I'm afraid, I must always be in control. I have to have the last word. I have to be secure. It, that's what it is, beloved. It's basic security. It, it makes me feel that I'll always be in control if I can be demanding, always have the last word, always have my way. But here's what we need to remember. If, if you're that person that's, that's demanding and you always have to have your way and, that, and you have to admit inside it's because of fear, remember this, the Lord is your helper. You don't need to do that. I love Hebrews 13, 6. The Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? You ought to, you ought to take that verse and put it on your mirror in, in the morning and look at it every day. You ought to tape it to the dash of your car. And remind yourself over and over again, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear what man can do to me. Well, there's nothing that Uncle so-and-so can say this Christmas that's going to, going to cause me to... to huddle back in my fearful abode and become loud and demanding this year like I always do. I'm not going to let it happen this time. Yeah. So fear kills the joy in family relationships. Well, now that we know what kills the joy, let's talk about how to build that joy. And the key to joy is perspective. Did you know that? That's what I've been talking about. Why does this relative act the way they do? Why does this friend speak or say what they say? What, what perspective should I take on this? It's all about 
perspective. You see, perspective is everything when it comes to overcoming the killjoys of family relationships. The way you look at a problem will determine whether you're going to be miserable or joyful. Remember what I said a moment ago? It, the way you look at this problem, the way you look at this person, understanding the person, looking for the possibility that, that somebody may be hurt, gives you a new perspective on how you approach them. There have been times when I have even been counseling with someone and finally a truth comes out that gives me a new perspective and all of a sudden I already know how to counsel with them now whereas before I didn't even know who I was talking to. It's all about perspective. The way you look at a problem will de determine whether you will be miserable or joyful. In fact, here's, here's a perfect example of perspective. I'm going to read a letter to, to you today from a, a young girl who was away at college. And listen to what she said. Dear mother and dad, it has been three months since I left for college. I have been remiss in writing, and I am very sorry for my thoughtlessness in not having written before. I will bring you up to date now, but before you read on, please sit down. You're not to read any further unless you are sitting down, okay? Well then, I'm getting along pretty well now. The skull fracture and the concussion I got when I jumped out of the window of my dormitory when it caught fire shortly after my arrival are pretty well healed by now. I only spent two weeks in the hospital, and now I can see almost normally and only get those headaches once a day. Fortunately, the fire in the dormitory and my jump was witnessed by an attendant at the gas station near the dorm, and he was the one who called the fire department and the ambulance. He also visited me at the hospital, and since I had nowhere to live because of the burnout dormitory, he was kind enough to invite me to share his apartment with him. Well, it's really a basement room, but it's kind of cute. He's a very fine boy, and we have fallen deeply in love and are planning to get married. We haven't set the date yet, but it will be before my pregnancy begins to show. <laughs> yes, mother and dad, I am pregnant. I know how very much you're looking forward to being grandparents, and I know you will welcome the baby and give it this, the same love and devotion and tender care you gave me when I was a child. Now, the reason for the delay in our marriage is that my boyfriend has some minor infection which prevents us from passing our premarital blood test, and I carelessly caught it from him. But it will soon clear up with the penicillin injections I am now taking daily. <laughs> Now that I have brought you up to date, I want to tell you there was no dormitory fire. I did not have a concussion or a skull fracture. I was not in the hospital. I am not pregnant. I am not engaged. I do not have syphilis, and there is no man in my life. However, I am getting a D in sociology and an F in science. And I wanted you to see these grades in proper perspective. <laughs> it's all about perspective, isn't it? Some of you fathers were out there having heart attacks. <laughs> well, let's look at the proper perspective while, while you all catch your breath. You see, perspective makes all the difference and perspective is what causes you to focus on what you need to focus on. You see, what that girl wanted her dad to focus on was forgiveness for the D and the F. Amen? So what should we focus on to have a joyful family relationship? Well, here we go. Number one, focus on giving rather than receiving. We kind of said this a moment ago, but I want to ex explain a little bit further. In order to have any good relationship, we must focus on the other person. You know why so many families are broken today? Because society, listen, and boy, society has been so good. I was listening to a program on the way home just the other day on the radio, and they were talking about how this society, more than any other American society, has been trained to be selfish. You ever notice that? We have been trained to do the exact opposite of this first step. What's the first step? Focus on giving rather than receiving. Society today tells us, look out for number one. 
How many times have you heard someone say, I've got to do what's best for me? I heard an actress one time, they were interviewing her on television, and she had deserted her family. She had been aloof toward her kids. She had been distant to her husband. She had had several divorces. Uh, there was no relationship with her children. She was talking about how that they all hated her guts, and she said, I realize all that, but she said, I had to do what's best for me. I got news for you, young lady. That wasn't best for you. That was the worst that could happen. You may have made it in Hollywood, but you struck out with your family. And when you're passing away, when you're going into the other life, you're not going to care about what you earned in Hollywood. You're only going to care about your family. We need to think about these things. You hear people say, what's in this relationship for me? This is the perfect way to be miserable. Acts 20, 35 says, it is more blessed to give than to receive. And our Father knows what he's talking about. Christ knows what he's talking about. Marriages. Why, why are marriages falling apart, preacher? Because one of the main reasons is we tend to do all the giving in our society up front in a relationship. Let me give you an example. Uh, we put more emphasis on starting the relationship than we do on maintaining it. You know, the typical American man has this attitude about marriage. He One day he says, well, you know, uh, I probably need to get married. And uh, so then he says, I know what, I'll, I'll find a woman that I'm attracted to and I'll do everything to win her love. And so here he goes. He, he buys her flowers, calls her every day on the phone, goes and does what she wants to do even if he hates it. But then the moment he gets married, his attitude changes. The moment he gets married, he says, mission accomplished. Mission accomplished. Now on to the next goal. Now let me say this in this man's defense a little bit. The next goal is usually his job. And his intentions are good because he thinks, well, I've got to have a good job and I've got to maintain this job. I've got to give the, all my time to this job to take care of the marriage. But his poor wife all of a sudden says, what happened to Prince Charming? All of a sudden, Prince Charming disappears and she never sees him again. And that reminds me of, of something else I, I read not long ago. It's, a, it's the five stages of marriage. Listen to the first year of some marriages. Here's the husband speaking to his wife. Baby darling. That's what you use, isn't it? Rod, isn't that what you say, baby darling? Yeah. Baby darling, I'm worried about that sniffle you have. I've called the paramedics to rush you to the hospital for a checkup and rest. I know you don't like hospital food, so I'll bring all your meals myself. That's the first year. Now, how many of you ladies, that, that, that's how it was in your first year? Okay, well. Se second year. Sweetheart, I don't like the sound of that cough. I've called Dr. Jo Johnson to make a house call. But before he gets here, let me tuck you into bed. Second year. Third year. You look, you look like you have a fever. Why don't you drive yourself down to the Metastop Clinic and get some medicine while I watch the kids. Fourth year, look, now be sensible. After you fed and bathed the kids and washed the dishes, you ought to get into bed. Fifth year, for Pete's sake, woman, would you stop coughing? I can't hear the TV. Would you mind going into the other room while the game is on? You sound like a barking dog. <laughs> now, wait a minute. <laughs> I, guys, I, I, it's not just you. Women do this too. I heard one guy. <laughs> you need some relief about now, don't you? I heard one guy say, well, it used to be when I came home, my wife brought me slippers and my dog came barking. Now it's reversed. So, 
<laughs> you know, I got to stop this. This is a Baptist church. <laughs> but I hope you got the point. Listen, you see, it's a choice. It's a choice. We need to focus on giving rather than receiving. Joy comes from making others happy. Think about that. You know, I've told you how that um, when your children see you sacrifice, that they love to sacrifice. They learn to sacrifice. But not only is that true, but the relationship. Sa sacrificing for somebody else creates a bond that you couldn't create any other way. Well, my, my kids love me, and I'm, I'm blessed because of that. I certainly don't deserve it. I've failed in so many ways, and, I, and I'm not even kidding. There was a day when I was more married to the church than I was to my wife and more involved with the family of God than my own family. By God's grace, he rescued me from that. I'm so grateful and so thankful. It happened in time, and I praise God for that. But, but my precious wife, as she's home ill today, but my precious wife sacrificed over and over again, and my kids saw it. They saw it in the meals where she would walk away. I told you about this just recently and excuse herself and, and pretend that she was busy because there wasn't enough food to go around. They've seen her when she would, when she would go to uh, the uh, hand-me-down stores and buy what was there and buy the kids something brand new and then buy older clothes for herself. And over and over again, they've seen my wife sacrifice. And it's, it doesn't bug me that when they both call, they talk to mom a lot far, more, longer than they talk to me. That's okay. That's okay. Because they bonded with that woman who was continually over and over and over again giving of herself to them. They were her attention. They were her second to the third to the Lord and her husband, they were her priority. Is that what you want in your relationships? Then learn to focus on giving rather than receiving. And then number two, focus on healing rather than hurting. In family relationships, there will be misunderstandings. There's going to be conflicts. It's going to happen. You can't get two people together in a room for a whole day without something happening. There are going to be conflicts, and there are going to be some inconsiderate remarks. Sometimes people make inconsiderate remarks, and they don't even know they have. Even when you love somebody deeply, it's going to happen. But how you handle these hurts will determine whether you have joy or resentment in your family. That's the key. You know what the key is to successful families? It's not that, you, look, look, successful families, loving families, harmonious families are not families that never have problems. They're not families where, where an inconsiderate word is never said. No. No. Even our state song says, seldom is heard <laughs> a discouraging word. You're... No, successful families are those families that when those things happen, they know how to respond to it. How you handle those hurts will determine whether you have joy or resentment in your family. And the problem is, it's human to hold on to your hurt. Have you ever noticed that? When somebody hurts us, we tend to hold on. Some folks, we hold on to it. Some folks even revel in it. There are some folks, I have counseled with them, I've talked with people who love being miserable in their hurt, licking their own wounds. They love it. And they rehearse it over and over in their minds instead of dropping it immediately. We need to realize that it hurts us more than it does the other person when we do that. In fact, there's a lot of... The, a good portion of the time, the other person doesn't even know you're hurting. So why would you continue to hurt when they don't even know you're hurting and don't care about it anyway? Unbelievable. And there's absolutely no value in rehearsing the pain. Colossians 3.13 tells us 
to forgive others just as Christ forgave us. That's the one that works for me every time. When I begin to feel anger and resentment rising, I remember, oh, wow. Lord, I've done so much to you and you forgave me. Who am I not to forgive this person? Good night. That one does it for me every time. Now, there's one reason that we can release our pain other than the fact that Christ has already forgiven us, and that is when we release the pain and forgive our offender, we know that God can use that, that hurt for good in our life. Remember Joseph? Well, you can't, you can't get more family rejection than Joseph got. They hated him. They were jealous of him. They despised him. They threw him in a pit. And then on top of that, they sold him into slavery. And were going to kill him if one of the brothers hadn't protested. But what happened? He became second in command to the entire nation of Egypt. He said, you intended it for harm, but God meant it for good to save a lot of people. Folks, listen to me. What if... What if, it, what if God's intention in your family is to let you be hurt for a while and, and it lets you to absorb that hurt and forgive those in your family and see an entire neighborhood, city, nation saved, perhaps because of your testimony? Think about that. Romans 5, 3 and 4, Paul said, We also glory, or in other words, rejoice in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance, and perseverance, character, and character, hope. And don't believe the myth that says, when all of your problems get solved in this relationship, then you'll be happy. By the way, that's why some folks leave a relationship. Well, I, can't, I, I, don't, I never see these problems being solved, so I'm leaving. Chances are slim that all problems in any relationships are ever going to be totally solved. You see, as soon as you get one thing solved, haven't you learned this? There's usually another. If we think the only time we'll ever have joy in our families when all the problems are solved, we'll never have any joy. We'll never have any joy. You must learn to have joy even while working on the problems in your relationship. So we need to focus on healing rather than hurting. And then number three, we need to focus, and this is the most important, on God's power rather than our problems. We need to learn to trust God regardless of our circumstances. You may not be able to trust your spouse right now. You may not be able to trust your siblings right now. You may not be able to trust your parents right now. You may not be able to trust your children right now, but you can trust God. You can trust God. We can trust him to deal with them and strengthen us. Psalm 62, 8 says, Trust him at all times, you people. Pour out your heart before God. God is a refuge for us. Say that with me again. Do, do you have it there? No, you don't. We have it on the screen. Let's say, Trust him at all times, you people. Pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. Turn to your neighbor and say, God's a refuge for me. Amen. And now say God's a refuge for you. Amen. <laughs> God can give hope where it looks hopeless. Would you say, can you agree with that? He can repair the irreparable. We see that all the time here at Open Door in all of our ministries, the irreparable being repaired. God can give you the power to start over in a relationship. He's the God of the second chance, and everybody said. In fact, he's the God of the third, fourth, and fifth also. Amen. He can build trust where there's only been fear. Psalm 56, 3 says, when I am afraid, I will trust in you. Let's say it together. When I am afraid, I will trust in you. Now, let me just say this. Perhaps you came here this morning, and I'm saying this in closing. Perhaps you came here this morning. You were invited by a friend. Maybe you came here this morning because you heard that we were speaking on the family. And you said, I came here with a broken family preacher, and, and I need help. If you have never discovered the joy that Jesus can bring into a relationship, if you've never accepted him, I want you today, I want to invite you to discover it. 
I want you, when we, when we, in just a moment, when we pray, I want you to hold your life up to Christ and say, Jesus, come into my life. Put your joy in me. Forgive me of my sin. Accept me as your son. I believe you're the Lord of my life and of this world. You're the God of this world, of this universe, of all things. Forgive me for my sin. Thank you for what you did on the cross for me, Lord Jesus. I accept that as my, my payment for my sin. Come into my heart and give me this joy you've been talking about. And he will. He will. And as you practice these things we talked about today, you'll see this spread through your whole family. And even if it doesn't spread, it doesn't affect everybody. You learn today you can have joy anyway. You can have joy anyway. Let's bow for prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus, please help me to pray what you want me to pray. You know all the families here today. You know the individuals so much better than I'll ever know them. Holy Spirit, guide my words. Lord Jesus, be the Lord of this service. It doesn't matter one bit what I think about anything. It matters totally what you think. And so right now, in your name, with your authority. I am asking the Father to begin a healing in every family that's struggling here today. Holy Spirit, I'm asking you to go up and down every one of these pews, up and down these aisles, into every pew, and speak to the hearts of everyone today that's wounded and has a broken family. And Holy Spirit, I pray that husbands will go to wives, wives will go to husbands. If we have some adult children here, that they'll go to their parents, parents will go to the children. If there's any, any hurts that need to be healed today, that I pray, Holy Spirit, you won't let a single person allow fear to keep them from doing what they ought to do. Holy Spirit, I pray that there will be families that will come to this altar today and rededicate their entire family to you. I pray there will be families that will come and pray for the holidays right now that, that they will be honoring to you and that there will be healing and that no matter what happens, no matter what anybody says, what anybody does or, or fails to do, that they'll leave there full of joy. Full of joy. Oh, Father, by the power of your love today, we've been singing about you and your love for us. We've been talking about this. We've been talking about the love that, that Jesus spoke about having with you and, and him with us. And, and it's always been your, your idea with the family. That the family be the place where we first learn about the love of God. As we see it acted out, in our family. Lord Jesus, have your way in every heart. And if there's anybody here that's not saved, I pray that they'll take me up on my invitation a moment ago. Walk down this aisle and take a personal worker's hand and say, I'd like to, I'd like to accept Christ. I'd like to follow through. I'd like to see my relationships change and especially my relationship with God oh Lord have your way in Jesus name we pray and everybody said amen let's stand together